All right, let's do this. So good morning, good afternoon, good e evening. Hello from wherever you're joining us, welcome. Uh, my name is Sarah Dukevich, also known as Saduki, and I'm gonna give you a, a tour of domain-driven design, also known as DDD with C Sharp. Now I know if you do a search engine search for DDD, you get all sorts of crazy responses. The one we're looking at here is domain-driven design. All right, but we're gonna talk about what is domain-driven design. We're gonna talk about it, where we use it. Because we only have an hour for this webinar, we're gonna show it with a smaller demo, but if you wanna know more, I'll point out more on how you can get that. Okay, started recording, got the intro, let's go. All right, so I like starting my webinars with a quote because it helps you to understand where we're going with this. This quote comes from Domain Driven Design, which is the original book written by Eric Evans, I believe the year was 2004 where he talks about how the heart of software in general is to solve domain problems for its user. It's not about the technical. It's not about the, the, the regular business user doesn't care about the technical. It's about understanding the business and understanding the business's needs and understanding the business's logic, things like that. So we're gonna be looking at the domain related problems or also known as the business's problems. We're going to talk about what is DDD, give some basic concepts of that, because I know not all of you work with DDD every day. Some of you are very new to it. Some of you may have seen this uh, DDD stuff and have been working with it for years. So we have a wide variety. Let's bring everybody on the same page for that. And then I'm going to show the clean architecture template, which if you've been to past webinars with us, you know that I like using the clean architecture template. Uh, our Dallas, Steve Smith, he's the one who uh, maintains it with a bunch of us here at Nimble Pros as well. And then at the end, I have some additional resources, some ways to reach out with us. And then don't panic if you see all these links and you go, wait, we don't have the URLs. At the end of the recording, I will grab all of the URLs plus the link to the recording and you will get a thank you email with all these links in them. So make sure and get you taken care of so that right now you can just sit and pay attention, make notes of your own if you want, but don't panic if you don't have the websites. I've got you covered in a thank you email. All right. So first things first, what is DDD? Well, DDD, notice I have focus here on domain. It's domain driven design. You'll see other DDDs like domain. So we've got domain, you've seen like test driven design, behavior driven design, uh, pain driven <laughs> design. Uh, things like that. So domain-driven design is focused on the business first or on the business domain. What is the domain though? That, that That's just such a general term. So it talks about things like entities or things, nouns, um, behaviors, business logic. These are all part of what's known as the domain. The domain itself, the overall picture actually is made up of other little parts. So the core, the heart of it all, comes down to that core domain. What is the main focus of your business system that you are building? That'll be the main thing that you're going to want to focus on. Now, these different pieces parts may be created and uh, developed by different teams. If they're smaller, they may be like different teams have multiple subdomains perhaps, but the core domain is where you're going to have probably most of your developers. The supporting subdomains are parts of your business system that are important for supporting the core. And if one of those fails, it would cause a failure of the system in general. So that's why they're called supporting subdomains. Generic subdomains, think of those as they're helpful to have for the system, but if they aren't there, it's not gonna be an utter failure necessarily. These are more like off the shelf, uh, kind of libraries and things like that. So what does this look like with a core domain, some generic subdomains, supporting subdomains? This is what an, a DDD application would look like is you'd have these different domains and they'd all end up working together in the applications. Um, but the, I wanna point out specifically that you may have more supporting domains than generic domains. There will always be one core domain. Now, how do you go, but Sarah, some of these concepts, they all have equal weights. You will figure out through conversations 
which of your domains is the core. Uh, this month, we're talking about DDD and C-sharp and understanding where you can find this in code. Next month, we're going to be talking about domain storytelling. So having those conversations, drawing those conversations, and understanding how this all comes together. In September, we'll be talking about event storming. So having the conversations of understanding how things happen in the system and how do you find these domains and bounded contexts and how does this all come together in an activity? So we are now at the start of DDD webinars and DDD season for us. Um, and if you have ideas for other topics that you'd love to see, feel free to throw them our way. Uh, but we're excited to be sharing all of our DDD stuff here. Okay, so domain-driven design. Best summarized, again, by Eric Evans. And he's got a book called The Domain-Driven Design Reference. Um, there will be a link for this in that email, which includes a link to a free PDF. So free PDF from him, not like something where people are pirating it and then saying it's free. No, 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 this is a legit, and it's not one you have to put your email address in to get. Um, but he says the three main things are you're gonna focus on the core domain. So that goes back to that whole, what is the core of your business system that you're trying to focus on? Then you're gonna explore your models through collaboration between the domain practitioners. So the people who are in the business, uh, sometimes they're just general people who are doing the business things. Um, and sometimes they're the domain experts. So they understand the area very well. But you also have collaboration with the software practitioners. So now I know working in a technical and non-technical spot, it can get very tricky because you have the technical people who wanna talk tech with fellow geeks. And sometimes we get too excited about it and we get overly technical. Uh, so that's why next month when we do domain storytelling, I'll show you how you can have those conversations without getting too technical, without getting in the weeds and losing your users or your domain practitioners. Uh, but the third part of domain-driven design is speaking that ubiquitous language within what they call a bounded context. Now we'll talk about bounded contexts and what those mean. Yeah, as Josh points out in chat, technobabble, yes. Ugh. We lose our, our clients very easily with Technobabble because we're just like, oh, all these cool things and interfaces and inheritance and, and all the fancy other things. And they're just like, what is he saying? What is she saying? What are they talking about? I don't know. And I don't think they can help us. They're too technical. Um, so we'll try, we'll show how you get that in your code where you're using their language and their words, this ubiquitous language. You'll use it when you're conversing, but you'll also use it in your code. Now, domain-driven design, what are some advantages? What's so good about it? This ubiquitous language, you're going to hear about ubiquitous language over and over and over again. Huge fan of it, because we're all then speaking on the same terms. We're all using the same terminology. Like, for example, if we were working a medical system, well, who's the patient versus who's the client? If I'm doing a medical system design, I could be the patient or I could be the client and my child could be the patient or this could be a vet system and I could be the client and my pet could be the patient. So, I mean, there's all sorts of different things going on there. Having those conversations and understanding who fits what roles and what are the, the words that they use, this ubiquitous language gets it easier for you to communicate with the business side and the business side can communicate with us as well. And then looking at your code, it becomes a lot easier to understand what's going on. That ubiquitous language makes it easier to talk between technical and domain teams. This also allows us to ma map their business needs and their business domain concepts. So we'll talk about things like entities and aggregates and domain events, but how do we map those two business concepts? DDD makes it easy for us to do that. The business needs are more clear with a DDD environment. And the reason for that is the communication. There is improved communication. There's a seeking to have communication that matches across the board. That's important. Honestly, even if you aren't doing a domain-driven system, communication is is key on any software project. So domain-driven design, it just happens to be that the business needs are a little more clear because again, a lot more communication happens. 
with domain driven design and the various tools we can employ or the various practices we can employ, you'll see established boundaries between your code too. We'll talk about boundaries and bounded contexts and how those come into play in our subdomains here very shortly. But what I like most with domain driven systems is that they are built with a solid software architecture. So I've been dealing with domain driven systems as I look back on my history since about 2011 or so. Uh, I've done insurance, done financial, done some e-commerce. So you're going to hear a little bit and pieces here and there. Now, that's the good parts of it. But I'm not a salesperson who could be like, oh, here's all this good stuff and I'm not going to tell you about the bad stuff. I always am that person who's going to go, look, no tricks up my sleeve. And let me tell you about the bad parts too. It's, in, it's important to tell those stories. So DDD works really well when it's a complex business logic system. But if you're doing a simple CRUD app, you don't need DDD. In fact, DDD might be more complex than it needs to be. Your application is going to be that much more complicated to maintain for something so simple as CRUD. Create, read, update, delete. Do you really want that? Don't overcomplicate things. I know as developers, we see our tools and we're like, yes, this is so cool. I want to use it everywhere. But be real. Who's going to have to maintain this code later on? Be kind to future you. Make the right decision so that future you doesn't go, man, past Sarah, why did she go DDD for this CRUD app that we know is not going to grow beyond this thing? Now, if you have an application that is technically complex, so working with technology that's not as straightforward as you would hope, technically complex doesn't work well with domain-driven design. Keep in mind, you're dealing with domain experts, there's more collaboration, there's more communication, so it can be, come at a higher cost, but it is a trade-off. All right, so when do we want to use domain-driven design? So Vaughn Vernon has written many books in the domain-driven design uh, area. There's a series. Uh, one of the ones, I don't know if my camera's going to show it here nicely or not, is, yeah, it's getting kind of blurred out, is domain-driven distilled. He's got another one, which is implementing domain-driven design. And in the implementing book, he has a, a survey uh, of understanding, okay, what is your project and should you use DDD for it? So again, the focus is gonna be complex business systems. 30 to 40 user stories or use case flows are their target. Anything smaller than that could be iffy. I say iffy because if the application can grow into a more business complexity, then you might wanna still consider DDD. Uh, if you have features, that are gonna come consistently and they aren't always simple changes, DDD could be helpful in that. And if you're working in a new unfamiliar domain, domain-driven design may help with that. But again, it all comes back to your assessment of the business complexity of it all. If it's something that is small CRUD app, maybe a few user stories here or there, you don't anticipate it growing large, then on the other hand, you may just not need it. Now, who's using DDD? Where have we seen DDD? Well, again, we're thinking of complex business logic systems. Chances are, if there's a system that has to do some kind of calculations to give a yay or nay on something based on 10 billion factors, that's a, a good opportunity to see if that should be a DDD approach. So when you're booking travel, and trying to figure out the best flights. Uh, that is not a simple system. Those booking systems are most definitely gonna be possible for DDD. Uh, healthcare. So the link here talks about a science journal publication where they were looking at booking hospital appointments as well as dealing with insurance from a medical standpoint and how they took a domain-driven approach on that. Uh, one of the projects I've worked on in the past has been in finance and dealing with loans and doing yay or nay on that. 
especially if you have to do things like check a person's credit score and then based on that credit score do some other math and logic and things like that now i'm hitting all these different services works really well for domain driven uh, design for the land management example uh, the link to the deed system so in the netherlands there was a group that did a deed system using domain driven design and they have it very well documented these links I will make sure to include in the thank you email so that you can refer to them yourselves. And then e-commerce is the one that I fall back on often because most of my career has been working in e-commerce. And so dealing with online purchasing and looking at things like orders and products and customers and invoices. So looking at it from a customer standpoint, looking at it from an accounting standpoint, looking at it from a logistics and inventory standpoint, Notice now we have a lot of inventory or perspectives. This isn't just a straightforward CRUD app. There's a lot more going on than what it thinks. When, when you go searching online for a store and you're like, oh, I just want to buy this, this, and this, that's a simple look, but there's so much more that goes on behind the scenes for those. Okay. So that's who's using it, when to use it, when not to use it, the considerations. But what are the concepts in DDD that you should know about before we even jump into code? I mentioned ubiquitous language. Uh, so it's the language that's established between both the domain side, the business side, and the software side. Eliminate that techno babble that Josh mentioned in the chat. You want to have spoken and written, and you want words that make sense. You will see with the conversations, as I have in the illustration to the right, where I'm like, is it a patient? Is it a client? And then the domain expert will be, well, in this case, it's a patient. So you talk with the domain experts because they're the ones who know the system. Now, that's something else as developers that we have to embrace. And that's the fact that we are not the domain experts. We are just the people who solve their problems, but we can't solve their problems without their knowledge, without their background. Sometimes as developers, we get egos and we are just like, well, my code's gonna solve the problem. This is gonna be glorious. And by the way, I'm making up the words as I go. We can't do that. That makes a nightmare for communications. When the business has established lingo, that's when you need to listen to it and you need to listen in context. And in these conversations, ask for the context. Ask for the context as much as you can so that you can use those words properly. Because those words that you're speaking about while well, you're understanding that domain, those are also going to be things that you use in the documentation for your users to use those systems. And those are the words that you're gonna use in your code. You're gonna use the, the ubiquitous language to describe variables, methods, properties, classes, interfaces, namespaces, all of that is where you're gonna see the ubiquitous language. Now, why would you do that? For us as developers, including ubiquitous language in our code reinforces our understandings of the language. And then when we talk with our fellow folks on the domain side about what our code does, they can be like, but wait a minute, no, actually that's not the right word. You want to use this word and here's why. And so now you just refactor your code, right click and rename and go. So ubiquitous language, this is key. This is the, the communication that brings everybody together on the same page. Now entities, sometimes you'll hear me call them things, but in reality they're nouns. Entities specifically, have a unique identifier within their domain. An entity or a noun or an object may have properties where the, all the properties match, but there's always a unique identifier that makes them different. And the story I love to share with this about, is about my friend's name, Steve Smith. I have two of them specifically in the tech arena that I think the day that they were both at the same conference I kind of melted down like, oh no, they're both here. I got to keep this straight. And it's funny because now I work for one of them. Um, but yeah, they were, I was just like, uh oh, it's the two Steve Smiths. 
Well, they both have the same first name, last name. So they have the same properties. They both happen to be here in Northeast Ohio. So location wise, well, what's the unique identifier? They're physically different human beings. Thankfully, the Steve Smith that I work for here at Nimble Froze, he's got a, a nickname. He goes by our Dallas and he's been gone by our Dallas for quite a while. And my other friend, Steve Smith, is in the SQL space. And he used to have a blog called SQL. So there, in this case, their common identifiers are, happen to be nicknames. Now, if we were dealing with this in our code, these could be stored as IDs, not as strings. I would say use something like an integer or a long or a good. Yeah, I see Pedro's got a question here in chat about, so we should try to use their terminology. Absolutely. Using their terminology makes it easier for everybody when you're trying to talk through features and trying to understand each other's needs and what you can provide. <laughs> so yeah, you wanna use their terminology because you wanna try to have that common conversation. It just makes life easier in the long run. Not only do you use your terminology when talking with them, but you use it in your code to reinforce your understanding of their terminology. For me, I have found that using their terminology in code, if I can go straight to code, shows that I have a more solid understanding. Sometimes though, the convoluted processes, especially if we have to do some checks behind the scenes to go, they pass, they have a good credit score, now let's give them that. Um, sometimes I actually have to draw that out. So I use something like domain storytelling where I use pictures and arrows and tell that story to help me get to that terminology to then incorporate it into the code. So sometimes the, the using their terminology, you can go straight from words to code. Sometimes you actually have to draw that process out to understand it. Arlene. <laughs> Uh, yeah, describing founders, hair, no hair, wrote a book, eh, something like that. It's how do you clarify? All right, so that's that's entities. Again, with entities, keep in mind the key thing is that there's some unique identifier. With value objects, these are properties that have a mutable state. That means that they're set once on initialization or creation, and then after that, you can't change them. These do not have unique identifiers. Value objects, as the name suggests, are objects that hold values. If the value objects have the same properties with the same values, they are considered equal. And the example I like to use here is think about mail, snail mail, postal mail, whatever you may call it in your country, your area. Remember when we used to write these things called letters or greeting cards, or even when we used to write and then send things in the mail to people on the other side of the, the world? People, that got out through addresses. So in our example here, we have two physical letters, two physical cards. They're both going to 1313 Mockingbird Lane, Mockingbird Heights, California. Yes, if any of you recognize that, that is from the Munsters. Um, but the fact that I'm establishing here is these are the exact same address. I'm not gonna store this with an ID for like different IDs for each one. No, this is a value object. And we leave it as that because that is the purpose it serves. It is a collection of values that happen to match, but it does not need to be an entity in this case. Now you're probably going, but wait a minute. We could have entities, especially let's say if I was in a postal system and those letters are individual objects. Now we have to keep track of each of those. Okay, fine, except when you're looking at them, those are values typically that are going to be pulled off the object. All right, so aggregates. This is another term you hear in DDD. And with aggregates, it's a design pattern. There's a grouping typically of one or more entities. I have to say one or more because sometimes you may actually just have one entity that is an aggregate of itself. The top level, or like I call it, the, the entity that's in charge of it all, that's known as the aggregate root. 
In the aggregate pattern, the aggregate root is responsible for controlling access to all of its members. And for this example, I'm using order aggregate and product aggregate. Uh, this example I also use on our sister site, deviq.com. I just recently updated that with this example. So if you're like, wait, this looks familiar. This is what I created and updated recently. Uh, so order aggregate, this means that I have an order and that order can have a collection of line items. And those line items typically are going to have things like an ID, maybe a quantity, a product ID. That name that I have on order item is actually also from product, but I don't have the arrows pointing at product at all right now because I wanna show them in terms of their aggregates. Because you don't control order items at all through products. You control order items through the order or what is known as our order aggregate and the order is known as the aggregate root. Now, if you're wondering why do we include name and order item if it's already on product, it's historical tracking. You wanna include the name because the name may change. What if today you're ordering the product and you're going, you know what? I wanna buy this pen. And so you order it and you have a gulet on there, but you forgot to put the name on it, but you bought it and it was called a pen. And then tomorrow marketing decides, hey, you know what? Pen is such a boring, plain thing. Let's call it a calligraphy pen, a fountain pen, a let's get more descriptive name here. So now if you were to pull your order, it would show the descriptive name and not the historical name that you had initially purchased it under. So we include the name so that you have the data as that point in time. And no, I know that's not a fountain pen. I don't happen to have my fountain pens here on my desk. Okay, so next we have domain events. And from aggregates to domain events, Domain events are things that happen throughout the process. They're used to track that the events happened with stress on the past. So it's noun verbed is the secret recipe there. Not a secret, I promise you. Uh, typically, a pattern that you see is where it'll the application will send a command that has a message that gets handled by a handler for further processing. Uh, for example, you may have something where you started an order. Okay, well, when I start an order, what needs to happen? Or if I added an item to my order, for example, what needs to happen? I increase my order's quantity. What needs to happen? Things like that. There are things that can happen behind the scenes that don't necessarily have to happen immediately right then and there synchronously. And so in a domain event world, the domain events can happen. They can send this message on stuff can get processed and then they can come back to us. So let's say that I purchased an item and let's say I went with this fancy pen. Uh, so value objects is C-sharp records. I could see that. I could see that's Vitaly. You may also just see them as just classes, uh, depending on who's doing the implementation, records make a lot more sense. All right, so with the domain events, again, let's say I purchased a pen. So I added that item to my order. So order item added would get sent and it would append my pen to my order. Now let's say that I update it to quantity two. Okay, well now we, we added that to the, or updated the order, but then what else did we have to do? Well, maybe we had to update the price. And so we know that two times whatever the unit price is is here. And maybe I need to, for some reason, see taxes. So it calls the third-party tax system. I'm gonna mention third-party tax system because sometimes it's easier to find an off-the-shelf solution. And that goes back to your generic subdomains and finding a solution for those. So sometimes you have to use an off-the-shelf solution. Think of all the APIs you have to call. But it's one of those where we send that command out to a handler the handler then takes the message and then processes it and does stuff for further handling. 
uh, in the code that we're going to look at, which is the clean architecture template, we're going to use Mediator to handle our domain events. But I will, I have a slide on it later that says this isn't the only way that you can handle it. All right, next is bounded context. Bounded context, think of it as you have boundaries within a domain. It's a logical grouping uh, where you have entities, value objects, and aggregates, amongst other things, all grouped together. Uh, the example I like to use here, again, using with the e-commerce, we talk about things like payments versus invoices versus orders, products, customers, delivery. These are all different domains. These are all different areas to think about. Um, before I get with that, with orders, just so you can see in the bounded context, I may have orders as a boundary. Order items is an uh, entity within that. Order itself would be the aggregate, and they all live in that bounded context called orders. So the bounded context, think of it as your big grouping that can hold all these little things inside, but there are boundaries established. Now, depending, is there only one aggregate in a bounded context? No. Uh, you you may, typically you'll see an aggregate in a bounded context, um, but is there always only one aggregate? <sighs> not, not always. Uh, for the example that we're going to show here, you're going to see different aggregates. You're not going to see the bounded context called out explicitly compared to, say, something like a microservices setup. Um, but yeah, is there only one aggregate in a bounded context? Not always but it is a common pattern to see. Now you'll hear the terms bounded context and subdomains and people get confused really quickly because they sound so similar. They're like, well, are they the same thing? No. Yes, but no, I guess is the best way to put that. They're not the same thing in terms of where they sit in the spaces but they could map a subdomain to a bounded context. So it could be a one-to-one -one mapping. It has to do with the terminology of the problem space and the solution space. So is it part of the problem or is it part of the solution? Well, when you have that problem and you're doing the evaluation of understanding the problem, that's when you're doing things like your domain analysis and understanding your subdomains. Once you look at your subdomains, then as you go to solve the problem, you'll see which of those subdomains actually pan out as legitimate subdomains. Those will probably turn into bounded contexts. So it comes down to, is it a part of the problem conversation or is it part of the solution conversation? Shared kernel. Shared kernel is that overlap between bounded contexts. So as I show here on the right, you can have multiple bounded contexts in a domain. Uh, typically, you will have multiple bounded contexts. If there's an overlap between bounded contexts, that overlap is typically a shared kernel. That means it's shared code between them. Uh, this goes back to the question that I saw in the chat from Pedro about should we use, try to use their terminology. You'll use their terminology here, especially in the shared kernel, so that everybody who's having to integrate with the shared kernel, everybody who has to maintain the shared kernel, they have the shared understanding. All right, a shared kernel. All right, so we're going to do a demo of the clean architecture. I can't stress this enough. We knew that we we're going into this for a one hour webinar with not a full hour of a demo. So it's very simplified. However, uh, we'll take a look at how bound, bounded contexts fit in clean architecture. There's a question about that in the chat. So let's take a look here. We're going to use the clean architecture template that is maintained by our Dallas. Uh, I've done a webinar a couple months back on introduction to that template. So I'll make sure to include a link to that webinar as well in our thank you email so that if you have any questions about the template, you can refer back to that. You can always uh, reach out to us. All right, so I am going to switch over to my Visual Studio. Let's bring my Visual Studio over. 
Okay. So Visual Studio. All right, do you all see that? So you should see Visual Studio and I've got my Solution Explorer open. Now I've already created the clean architecture demo. I didn't change any of the code. I left all of the bones in there as is just so that we can walk through it and you can see where these pieces parts fit. Again, this is an oversimplified version compared to most DDD projects because DDD projects tend to have bigger bounded contexts. Uh, they typically have APIs, things like that. So the DDD demo that I'm using, I just called it demo DDD. Remember with the clean architecture template, if you're using it, do not put a dash in the names. There's a bug filed for that. It is still an issue today, so don't put a dash in there. Uh, I say that because creating DDD-demo and demo-DDD, yeah, that would cause problems. Okay, so we have here, and I'm not going to look at the tests today. The tests are a wonderful thing. Uh, Test-driven development goes hand-in-hand -hand with domain-driven development. You have testable code when you do DDD, writing those tests. It's a, a beautiful thing, but again, short on time. So just be aware that they're there. I acknowledge that they're there but we're not going to be looking at those. Today we're going to start looking at first the shared kernel. So again, we have core infrastructure and shared kernel and web, web being the website. But we're gonna look at the shared kernel. And the first thing I wanna show you there is the entity base. Again, entities, the nouns. And what did I say was the key thing to notice with them? Entities have a unique identifier. This is an abstract class. And notice here, you can support multiple types, multiple keys. Uh, by default, it's int. You can set it if you need larger, you can go into long, you can go into GUIDs. There are various other ways you can do your identifiers. However it is you do your identifiers, this is where you would change that, is here in the entity base. The other things to note that are here, so there's this domain event base for your domain events. Again, remember domain events are typically written as noun verbed, where verb is in the past. Uh, and they can have a collection of domain events. So you could have multiple events for what is a user might seem as one event might actually be a notification to two different systems. So what we have here with our domain events as you can see that on our entity base, so all entities that inherit from this will have a unique identifier. They'll have their collection of domain events. Uh, right here, you can see your I enumerable to access your domain events is read only. And then we have how you register a domain event, which will add it to the queue and then clear the domain event. These are all done as an entity. So all entities have their domain event support baked into it. This is how that works. Thank you, Pedro. Have a great day. All right, so that's entity base. The next one I wanna show is domain event base. Uh, I can use it in Solution Explorer. I'm gonna actually just put my cursor on domain event base and press F12 to jump to it. All right, and I am running Visual Studio, not any plugins or extensions that would remap any of my keys. So when I tell you I press a button to get there, uh, these are default mappings. Okay, we're still in the shared kernel. And we're looking at this abstract class domain event base, which implements iNotification, which is part of Mediator. So we have Mediator as part of this template. All domain events have this date occurred field. Domain events have a, a time stamp usually associated to them of some sort. So you know, when was that event fired? When was it triggered? what caused it to happen. And we defaulted to date time UTC now, just so that it's one less thing for you to have to remember. Now, do you always want it to be date time UTC now? Maybe, maybe not. So for example, we've had a, a development process where we have all these events that get fired off, uh, but now we've added a couple more events to it. 
we had events to the process. So now we need to go back and add those events in to our system. We have to what they call backfill it. Well, when we backfill it, does that date occur need to happen today or does it need to happen on the date that it was supposed to have happened? So you want to be able to override that, but sometimes it may not necessarily be UTC now. If you have to do something like a backfill to fill in uh, domain events that don't exit or that didn't happen but should have happened. So domain events, again, something happened that now is triggering more behaviors, maybe triggering logs, uh, kind of to see with an audit trail, also with uh, event streaming, things like that. All right, so that's your domain event base. Again, all entities can have domain events. Domain events say, hey, something happened. We have value objects. So I'm going to go back in Solution Explorer, back in the shared kernel, so you can see where we're at for that. There was a question about value objects. So this value object here is the base for all the value objects. Again, another abstract class. Um, and there's a reference in here to Justin Hewlett, who created a micro library for value objects. Some of his code is in this code base as well. For value object and where's the other one? Ignore member attribute. There's the link for his project in there. So you can see what those are. The other thing we want to look at in our shared kernel is the domain event dispatcher. The reason why I want to show you that here is that this is already implementing our uh, domain event dispatcher interface. So you can see what the interface shows. The interface for this demo is simply just take the events, dispatch them, and then clear them out. Uh, so that's that one. But just so you can see that this very specific implementation also lives here in the shared kernel. And it's a specific implementation because it is using mediator. Uh, you could do your implementation and have your events handled differently. Uh, for example, we have events that get sent off to be handled by end service bus. So that's another technology we've used with domain events, works really well. Things like that happen to be in here, but for our, this demo, here's our dispatch and clear events. And what's going to happen is when it does dispatch and clear, it's going to loop through the collection of the entities with events. It's gonna take those domain events. It'll clear the entities events and then it'll publish all of the ones that haven't been there. Now, this is the domain dispatcher and what it does. This will actually get triggered here in a little bit. We'll take a look at the DB context because we'll trigger this when we save objects. Okay, the last thing I wanna show in this area of shared kernel are the interfaces. So there's the repositories. Now, clean architecture uses entity framework and their DB context. It deals with repositories and read repositories. So that's where these two come into play. Uh, read repository, it will take in anything, including the aggregate root. Our aggregate root, right now there's nothing on that interface. Now, when you're like, but why is that here? Well, this is where you're gonna start. If there are things where your aggregate roots in general have, if they have to have certain properties or certain uh, behaviors, you're going to call that out here at the shared kernel level to apply to all of your aggregate routes across the board. Now, with the way that this is organized, our aggregate routes, we will look at when they are in the core, but we're not going to go to core just yet. So that's shared kernel. Shared kernel, again, that shared logic between bounded contexts. Next visitor is going to be into the infrastructure module. Infrastructure, this is where we do a lot of wiring of things. You'll see our AppDB context is there. Uh, again, startup setup, just so you're aware, this is how we set this particular demo to use SQLite. But if you wanted to use something like SQL Server or Postgres, there are other options there as well. If we wanna look at the default infrastructure module. The default infrastructure module, this is where things are registered to be used. And I wanna go specifically down to register common dependencies. The reason why I wanna point this out 
is because we're registering a few things. Well, there's our repositories for entity framework and we have our I repository and our I read repository. There's mediator. Here's our domain event dispatcher. So this is where this gets registered. So if you're not going to use the domain event dispatcher as part of the temp template, but have a different domain event dispatcher, this is where you remember to come in and register it. Again, where is this? This is an infrastructure. This is the default infrastructure module. We use this template with our clients often, and we come into this section often to register things for dependency injection. All right, so things I would go to is register the common dependencies, make sure that that's there. Uh, you may have some mediator open types, for example, if you're using mediator, your domain event dispatcher is there. Uh, the rest of this is not so much DDD specific, but again, that's where our registrations for DI come into play. The other thing that we're going to look at in an infrastructure is within the data folder, within the con uh, it's not in config, it's just within data. Yeah, we're not looking at config, we're looking just in data, AppDB context. Now you're probably wondering, but DDD, AppDB context, how are they related? In this case, for this demo, AppDB context, which you know is used with uh, Entity Framework, we're tying into the save changes. And we'll call that uh, dispatcher after we save changes. So let's take a look at what's going on here. So there's our AppDB context. We're injecting our domain event dispatcher. Again, we have those registrations and default infrastructure module. So we have to do items, projects, and contributors are some of the entities in this project. So we have DB sets for the entities. And then I'm going to scroll into save changes async. Save changes async, you can see, is going to call the save changes like it should. If there are no events, uh, then let's just, at first, if there's no dispatcher, we can't do anything about it. So just return the result as is. However, if there are events, let the dispatcher uh, go ahead and deal with it. And if there's a dispatcher there, then yeah, they can deal with the entities, uh, domain events. What's going to happen now is you'll see here's the entities with the events. So we're going to look at the change tracker. We're going to find all of the entities where they have domain events and put those entities in an array. And then we're going to pass it to our dispatcher and say, hey, dispatcher, take these domain events and dispatch and clear events, whatever that means, which we already had looked at, which if I do shift F12 to look at it, uh, I don't think any of my windows are appearing. Just control F12 to take to the implementation. And you can see what it'll do is it'll take the entity. Remember, our entities have their collection of domain events. And for each one of those domain events, it's going to publish it. And then Mediator is going to handle on that. Oh, Victor, a good, good call on that one. So there is controversy on when domain events should be processed before or after the save changes. Uh, and what else do we have in here? What if we need to emit event before persist record to DB? Okay, so whether you need to do things before or after, that's going to be up to you then to decide when to publish your domain events. What we have in the code for the dispatcher and doing that, we have that getting called at AppDB here after your save changes. But if you need to do something before, then go ahead and dispatch those domain events before as well. So that might be something like, did, this, did something, some kind of state change happen before you save those changes? The trick there is understanding the noun verb. So what past event happened that you could do? That's what you would need to do. So then you'd send your domain event before you persist the record or send it after, send it whichever time makes sense for your business needs. So I'm not gonna tell you which is good or which is bad because it's not a matter of good or bad. It's what are your business needs? What Are you needing to track something before you save those changes? Are you needing to tra track something after those changes? 
when I do an event or if I'm doing something before an event, I need to do something else, then trigger those changes. In my main project that I'm working on right now, I say project, I'm gonna use that term loosely. I'm not talking about a CS project, I'm talking about an actual big scale project. Uh, we have domain events throughout. We have dom domain events that happen after an event happens. We have domain events that happen before an event happens. Usually those befores are triggered because we deal with filling in a DTO. And that DTO, we want to capture that state before we save it. We want to capture something else. So the, to answer the questions of should it be before or after, that depends on your business logic. That depends on your business rules. And then Burke's question about if we need to emit the event before you persist the record to the DB, then go ahead and do so. In which case, so how does that happen? Well, then if you have to bring in your dispatcher, in, in this little scale, you can, or you can have set, have something that sends a command and then something that listens to that command. So for example, we have a, a sender where we send our commands and then we have, and service bus has, we have some listeners who will listen and then we'll work with those domain events. So I'm not gonna tell you, you shouldn't do one or the other because I've got cases for times when you need those. It's just going to be then, okay, if you need to trigger an event, trigger the event, bring in the dispatcher if you have to, or send the call to a queue and have some thing pull it off the queue. Okay, so that's, this here is just so you can see where we call the dispatcher and where we dispatch our domain events. I think this is the only place I've seen it in the code recently. It's been a while since I've looked at it, but just so you're aware that that's where they get triggered in the sample code. Okay, so we've looked at shared kernel uh, infrastructure. The last one I wanna show you, and I know we have about 10 more minutes, is the, uh, the core. And in core, this is where our entities are. This is where our aggregates are. Things to note. So bounded contexts in this demo are not explicitly called out. You may see bounded contexts. Some people may see them as their own projects and libraries. I've seen that. Uh, APIs and separate APIs for them. I've seen that. In this case, we're using folders for the aggregates and working off of them that way. And that's fine because this is a small demo. So just be aware, how do you see bounded contexts? Commonly you're gonna see those in like namespaces and folders, maybe projects, depending on how large the project is. Now, what makes an aggregate? So in the slides I showed products and uh, orders, but in this demo, we have contributors and we have a contributor entity, notice. This contributor is not just the entity, but it is also the aggregate root, as in it is, this is just like how product was in our slides. This is just an aggregate of one entity. So here's our I aggregate root and entity base for contributor. It has an ID that's over on the entity base side of it, but then it also has the name thing. These guards, this is using uh, our Dallas guard clauses. You'll see our Dallas references throughout now events, notice here that events, these are domain events. So those questions you asked about the domain events before and after, this is one that happens after something was deleted. Uh, before something was deleted, you may wanna catch values and, and save that. So, or who, who triggered the delete, things like that. You would use something like this. So these are part of the contributor aggregate. Again, the contributor aggregate's a small aggregate. The project aggregates are bigger aggregate. This one, notice we have our events. We actually have handlers here again for the demo. We have specifications for querying for projects and items and things like that. But I wanna take you through project itself. Why do I start here? Because this is our aggregate route for the project aggregate. Notice that we have our priority status, our project status, they are accessible through the project. The aggregate route 
gets us the access to the children. If we look at like project, then there's add item, update name, things like that, that all happens here on the aggregate route. Now, what is a priority status? I wanna jump right to that. Notice priority status. This is a smart enum, our Dallas uh, smart enum project uh, class. This does not have any of the logic. This does not have any like settings and gettings and things like that, or like, how this works with if it's backlog do this if it's critical do that things like that are not toggled within here if you want to work with priority status priority status is a thing of project it is on the aggregate route same thing here with project status tied to the project aggregate route to do item to do item is part of the project aggregate it is an entity so this is an aggregate that has multiple entities. But again, with the entities, I've got things like I can mark it complete. I can add a contributor. I can do some of this stuff. But a lot of this other stuff, in order to get to it, I have to start at the aggregate root. I can't create an item by itself. So, so this is where the aggregate roots are. And this is where the aggregate entities are. And they're organized through folders. Now, interfaces you see are by themselves. You may choose to organize them. If it gets a little wild and out of hand and you have a lot more pieces, parts, create the folders and interfaces. Make use of the tools that we have in order to organize our code in reasonable manner. All right, so we've looked at aggregates. Then the events are tied to their respective aggregates. Each of those aggregates have their own folders. Uh, with the contributor, we show deleted, but you could do contributor created or contributor updated. Events, you could do things like new item added. You could say item updated, or in this case, you see the items completed. So there are various other events that you could do later. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Will this recording be available for viewing later? Yes, it will. So it takes a while for Zoom to do the processing because this is stored in the cloud, but once that's done, I will add that to our thank you email and I will send the thank you email to everybody who signed up for this event. And then if you happen to know folks who wanted to see this, who couldn't make it, I will have another link out there as well for those who wanted to get access to the recording but weren't able to sign up in the first place. So we'll make sure this is available. All right. And then just so you can see what the handlers, what does the handler look like? We've got the repository. We're going to find the projects that are by a particular contributor, list those projects, and then for those, update them, remove a contributor, things like that happen, happen to hand, be handled here. So the handlers are an event happened. I've got a message that comes through. It is whatever the event is, what happened. In this case, I have the domain event with the contributor ID. And the contributors I know in this in the demo example are, are Dallas and Snowfrog. Hi, Snowfrog, I see you in the audience. Um, Snowfrog dev. So yeah, they're in here in the code. They, we would pass in their contributor IDs and then from the contributor IDs do things based on certain events. So this is where you find the different pieces parts using clean architecture. Clean architecture is a good way to get started with this. Um, other than that, it'll, it can grow really quickly. Now I'm going to skip to the additional resources. We have gone through and looked at the clean architecture. These are additional resources for getting started with domain-driven design. So there's tackling complexity in the heart of software, uh, domain-driven design distilled by Von Vernon. I like it in, uh, as a quick read, but I would say if this is your first DDD book, don't go with this one. This one is good for a high-level overview once you have a better understanding of what the pieces parts are. Implementing domain-driven design, if you're in a DDD environment where you have to do serious development, this would be great for that. Uh, Rama has a question, source code going to be shared along with the recording? No, however, I will include a link to the Clean Architecture webinar, which tells you how to get started with the Clean Architecture webinar, uh, with the Clean Architecture template, which is what I did here. I have no special code in today's demo, it's just the Clean Architecture demo. We have additional resources. 
DevIQ is one of our sites. Uh, I've just submitted a bunch of updates to that for domain-driven design. So some of the stuff you saw today, you will see on that site. But then these are some other resources that we use. The Pluralsight course with domain-driven design fundamentals with Stephen Julie. I can't recommend that enough. It is an amazing approach, uh, understanding DDD, and it's a relatable experience for everybody. Uh, in terms of us and upcoming webinars, so next month I'm doing domain storytelling. Looking forward to working with you all on that. September, I'm going to have probably some co-presenters help me with event storming so you can see what that process looks like. What does it solve? Maybe we'll do a mini exercise. Uh, I am also presenting the Talk Legacy Monolith to Microservices via event storming at Momentum DevCon in Cincinnati, Ohio on October 19th. I'm doing that same talk again at Tech Bash, which is in Pennsylvania, sometime between November 7th to the 10th. So we will be able to talk about that. Um, I'll give you a spoiler alert from legacy monolith to microservices. We're probably going to end up in the middle in what we call a modulith. So it's not a monolith, but it's not pure microservices either. I'll give you the tips and tricks on how we get to that point. If you're interested in more, if you want help implementing DDD in your environment, uh, CICD, that was last month's topic for our webinar, uh, upgrading to .NET 7. Uh, eventually, we'll be doing .NET 8, which is coming up in November. So if you need assistance upgrading to a newer version of .NET, uh, clean architecture, domain-driven development, a lot of software architecture topics in general, this is the stuff we do here at Nimble Pros. So if you're interested in learning more, or if you're looking for another example of DDD, a little more in depth than just the clean architecture template, reach out to us. You can scan the QR code on the screen or hit that bit.ly link, bit.ly slash contact dash MP. That will take you to our contact form. And rest assured, there are humans at the other end who see that form and who will be in touch with you. All right. I think I got all the questions. The awesome section you can see. And who is this Artalis character? Hi, JD. Artalis is Steve Smith. I don't know that he's in our audience today. He wasn't sure if he was able to make it, but he is awesome. Uh, he's he's great to work with. I saw there was another question in chat. Let me catch that. It was for the end of this. Uh, DDD and Donna Entity Framework webinar coming anytime. I do not have that question at all, but it is something for us to think about for sure. Thanks, Phil, for coming. All right, so there's a question about value objects and how they're stored in the DB. Notice we didn't talk about databases so much because database-driven versus domain-driven usually conflict. But let's see what we got here. So the question was about value objects. How are they stored? Then they turn into a, some sort of a lookup table. Yeah, yeah. If we're trying to address check that the address is valid, the lookup table is where it's at. So how would you handle this uh, to the lookup table? So, uh, value objects and having valid value objects can be a challenge. So, yeah, I mean, all right, so within the app to trace an entity state, yeah, I would say if you're trying to do that, a lookup table of the valid address state could help. Uh, so I guess, Paulot, my question for you is, do you have to call an API of some sort, like a US Postal Service, to get the technically correct address? And are you trying to store the technically correct address? Or are you trying to store what the, the person entered for their address or trying to get both of those? Because that's one of those, you're trying to store the correct one. So I would say with that one, in a system where I have to do address validation, I would have an event, a domain event where, okay, I, it's gonna be something like address validated. And then in an address validated event, I may have the initial one as well as the correct one. So you know, you capture that user input, but then you also capture what the service came back as. And so then from the domain event, let the domain event handler decide what needs to get written to the database. 
if you have to write that to the database. And then the domain handler can handle that in logic to go and write it to the database at that point. But I would say have a domain event. Yeah, have a domain event there to capture it. And like I said, capture both the user's in, in, input and then the suggested correct version. Awesome, thank you all for coming and I hope to see you at future webinars.